What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. You can find my written work, uh, my running back rankings over at NoahMoreParties.com. We get three articles a week over there. They're pretty good. Uh, check it out. But today's article, today's video, this is not an article. Uh, didn't write anything. Today's video is, uh, I, I looked at keep trade cuts rankings, running back rankings in Dynasty with rookies removed, just veteran, current NFL player running back rankings. And then I looked at my own Dynasty running back rankings, and I found the guys who had the biggest discrepancy uh, two weeks ago, I think. I made a similar video where I was talking about the most undervalued running backs currently in Dynasty. Talked a little about Damian Pierce in that video. Talked a little about Aaron Jones in that video. And talked a little bit about, I believe, Christian McCaffrey in that video. Today I'm doing the opposite. Today I'm going to talk about three running backs, really, really two, but, but I got three, who I believe are the most overvalued running backs in Dynasty right now. Let's get into it. <laughs> Uh, the first guy is a guy who I talked about quite a bit in that other video when I was talking about Damian Pierce, uh, and that is Javante Williams. I'll just go, you know, real quick over him. Um, he's the current RB 13 right now at Keep Trade Cut, and he's my RB 18. Two weeks ago when I made that video, he was the, I think he was the RB 10 in Dynasty uh, over at Keep Trade Cut. So market mover uh, this, this analyst, this show, this YouTube channel, we're moving the market. Uh, people are souring on Javante and I'm taking all the credit, but he's still a little bit overvalued in my mind and the same reasons apply. Basically what we've seen him do in the NFL is be decent as a rookie. He was like solid, nothing spectacular. He matched one for one the efficiency of Melvin Gordon, produced like a low end RB2. Then the next year, the team was way worse than we expected it to be with Russell Wilson, but Javante wasn't, you know, he, he wasn't good either. He wasn't particularly productive except for in week one when he had like 87 catches from dump offs from Russell Wilson that represented like a quarter of his season long fantasy points in the time when he was healthy. But then the big thing is that then he became not healthy. He got hurt. He ripped up his entire knee, PCL, MCL, ACL, I believe all in the same knee. You know, there's there's speculation out of, you know, the combine via Matthew Barry that he could start the season healthy, could miss several games, or could miss the entire season. We don't know what's happening with Javante Williams, and so we've got a player that everybody assumes is really good, but we haven't actually seen be really good, who wasn't that good last year. Not that he was bad, but like people people were drafting him as the RB2 in Dynasty, and he didn't play like that. So even on a bad team, and now he's got Sean Payton there, who's a good coach, but is a committee backfield coach. They brought in, who was it, Samaj P. Ryan to be part of that committee, according to Samaj P. Ryan himself. So this is very likely to be a split backfield again in some fashion. Javante hasn't proven to be as good as everybody thinks he is, and we don't know about this injury thing. So Javante Williams... Uh, was being overdrafted at RB10. He's still being slightly overdrafted at RB13, but good job to everybody for souring a bit on Javante Williams. But the, the guy, the first guy I really want to talk about in this video is Rashad White, who is the current RB19 at Keep Trade Cut, is my RB35. Maybe I'm overdoing it a little bit. I, I would hear arguments uh, in that direction, but Keep Trade Cut, the community in general, is definitely overdoing it from the other direction with Rashad White. Last year, he averaged 8.2 PPR points per game, making him the RB43 on a per-game basis. And there was like a an eight-game stretch in the second half of the season, seven-game stretch, something like that, in the second half of the season where he had 10 or more touches in each of those seven or eight games, whatever it was. So even if we just, we ignore the early part of the season, he was just kind of like, you know, acclimating to the offense, earning more playing time. And then like in the last game of the season, he like had five touches. So even if we, we, we give him a really charitable view and we don't even account for those parts of his season at all, only the games when he had 10 plus touches, which was like a seven or eight game stretch, he averaged 11.85 PPR points per game in that stretch. That would have made him the RB26 on a season-long basis, so not even an RB2, and straddles where guys uh, Latavius Murray finished as the RB25, Jarek McKinnon was the RB26 last year, Rashad White, even if we just look at his rookie season charitably, just the games when he got you know a decent amount of volume, he was producing at a Latavius Murray, Jarek McKinnon season-long level. So basically... At his very best as a rookie, Rashad White was basically the 2017 Vikings backfield post Dalvin Cook injury. So that's what we're drafting at RB19 right now. And he really wasn't even good on a per-touch basis, uh, ignoring volume and things like that. 
his box adjusted efficiency rating and relative success rate, which look at his his efficiency relative to what the other guys on the offense are producing on a per carry basis, given the box counts that, that they're seeing adjusted for the defensive fronts that you're carrying the ball into. And box adjusted efficiency rating looks at per carry averages. Relative success rate looks at per carry success rates given down and distance uh, situations. He was slightly above average in both. 102.7 box adjusted efficiency rating, 0.3% relative success rate, in the 52nd and the 53rd percentiles, respectively, decent. But one of the the kind of calibrations you sort of need to make in your head when you're using team relative efficiency metrics, which I do a lot, is we kind of assume with these metrics that the baseline of 100% for box adjusted efficiency rating and the baseline for 0% is represents like a baseline. If you're above that, then you're above average. If you're below that, then you're below average. And generally that's true. But these numbers for Rashad White specifically were relative largely to Leonard Fournette. And Leonard Fournette is maybe an average running back, but he's probably at best an average running back at this point in his career is in terms of as a ball carrier, he hasn't added much value in the in the running game since like 2019, the last time his efficiency numbers really looked nice. And the Buck, like he's currently not on a team. Leonard Fournette, the Bucks were happy to let him walk. Every other team in the league has been happy to leave him unsigned as of now. If you're doing exactly like like Javante Williams basically duplicated the the per carry efficiency of Melvin Gordon one for one last season or two years ago with you know whatever so however you felt about Melvin Gordon probably influenced how you feel about or how you felt about Javante Williams at, at, you know at the time I felt at the time that Melvin Gordon was like an above average runner so Javante Williams is probably an above average runner I I feel like Leonard Fournette at this point in his career is a mediocre runner and Rashad White did barely better than him last season so he's uh, what a mediocre to maybe average runner while also playing behind a bad offensive line and producing like 3.6 raw yards per carry like yeah his 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 raw efficiency was bad but his efficiency relative to another running back that we kind of know to not be that good right now also wasn't very good. It's not like he was, it's not like his 3.6 was relative to, you know, team-wide averages of 3.1. He was basically doing what everybody else in the, in this poor running game was doing. Not very impressive, but even outside of the team relative efficiency metrics, this, this stuff on playerprofiler.com, his true yards per carry, number 65 in the league, his yards per touch, number 48 in the league, despite being a receiving back, uh, his juke rate, it's like their their elusiveness metric. Number 36 in the league, his breakaway run rate. Number 44 in the league, yards created per touch. So outside the influence of Leonard Fournette on his team relative efficiency metrics, outside the influence of the offensive line on what he's doing, yards created per touch, number 35 in the league. He wasn't a starting level running back by any of those metrics and well outside the realm of starting level running backs. Uh, by most of them. So, like, like, what are we doing here? If, if I would say Rashad White landed more on like the Kenyon Drake side of the the range of, you know, people were making like, you know, maybe he could be Kenyon Drake, but he could also be like David Johnson or Alvin Kamara. I was one of the those people saying that, and I still think that that was like a reasonable thing to, you know, that that was a region a reasonable range of outcomes for him. Maybe on the low low end, it was like Charles Sims or something. But these these 215 220 pound running backs who you know like contribute well in the passing game as versatile receivers, and maybe they can run the ball because they're good athletes, and otherwise they just won't be able to run the ball much. It's looking like Rashad White ended up on the Kenyon Drake side of things, but even Kenyon Drake was way better than him early on in his career. Drake posted a box adjusted efficiency rating and a relative success rate each above the 70th percentile in both of his first two seasons in the league and in five of his first six seasons in the league. So nobody really thinks Kenyon Drake is that good. He's a fine player. Rashad White was worse last year than Kenyon Drake pretty much ever was through his first six seasons in the league. So even if you're looking at Drake as the low end of the Rashad White range of outcomes here, you're like, okay, he wasn't good enough as a rookie that we can say he's like on the David Johnson, Alvin Kamara trajectory. But the low end of his range of outcomes was still Kenyon Drake. He didn't even hit that. He's He was worse last year than Kenyon Drake ever was. So even if we're, we're like assuming he's Kenyon Drake, I don't think that's a safe assumption. What we are assuming is that at RB19 prices that he steps into the RB1 chair here and gets more work without Fournette in the picture, which seems reasonable. Uh, but first of all, that assumes that the Bucks don't take a running back uh, at some point in the draft or, you know, relatively early in the draft that can eat into or, you know, supplant 
Rashad White and his workload in this offense. But even if we assume that Rashad White gets more touches, during that, during that stretch where he had at least 10 touches in every game, he averaged 16 touches per game, which is a really nice workload. So we got like a half a season's worth of Rashad White with the kind of volume that we'd like to see. Uh, that That's within one touch per game of the, the workloads that guys like Kenneth Walker, Ezekiel Elliott, Ramondre Stevenson, Miles Sanders, Leonard Fournette, Jamal Williams, Aaron Jones, uh, Latavius Murray, Travis Etienne, all those guys had within, what, 17 to 15 touches per game, right in the Rashad White range. And we already know that Rashad White didn't score very well, even with that workload. He was scoring, what was it, 11.9 points per game, which is in the Latavius Murray and Jarek McKinnon range. Like, despite getting the same amount of work as guys like Ramondre Stevenson and Jamal Williams and Aaron Jones, and Tra like, he wasn't uh, Kenneth Walker. He wasn't producing, like, any of those guys while he was playing on an offense led by Tom Brady. Tom Brady's now gone. Maybe that means they'll run the ball more, you know, run the ball more, which means that we're hoping, we're, we're banking on Rashad White being better in fantasy because he now gets to do more of the thing that he s sucked at last year. Like, I, I don't understand what we're doing here. We we knew that Rashad White was an exciting prospect who we weren't positive was actually going to translate to the NFL, given some of his issues as a runner in college, consistency issues, given that he was, what, like a four, uh, I, I believe a five-year guy who came from community college, really didn't dominate um, at a legitimate level of competition until he was a 22-year-old, a 23-year-old. It makes sense that a guy like this isn't as good as we thought he could be because we knew the range of outcomes was wide. We we knew that this was a possibility. He didn't play good in year one. I I don't think he deserves uh, to be taken as a solid RB2 in Dynasty after what he did last season, given that his situation is probably getting worse because he didn't do well with volume last year, and now he's going to have a quarterback downgrade. Even if you believe in Rashad White, at least wait until after the draft. <laughs> at least wait until, until after the draft. Right now, his price is up because of Len because Leonard Fournette's not on the team. So you're not even getting like the pre-draft risk discount where like maybe they draft Zach Charbonnet and now it's like a, a two-man backfield where right now we're kind of assuming it's one without Fournette. So like don't even, don't acquire Rashad White now at the very least. Probably don't acquire him at all, but if you're going to wait until the draft. The second or the third guy I guess I want to talk about in this video is David Montgomery, who keep trade cut has right after Rashad White as RB20 is my RB32. Last year, year with the Bears. David Montgomery averaged 11.1 .1 points per game uh, in PPR, which made him the RB28 on a per game basis. And the guy that we're kind of, you know, collectively assuming that he just replaces one for one in this Detroit offense, Jamal Williams, averaged 13.3 points per game last year and finishes the RB18 on a per game basis. So mid RB2 was Jamal Williams. DeAndre Swift, the other guy in this offense, obviously 13.7 points per game, RB15. If Montgomery replaces Jamal Williams' production exactly one for one, if we just erase Jamal Williams' name and write David Montgomery, erase 2022 and write 2023, that's exactly what David Montgomery does. At RB20 prices, you're getting the RB18 on a per game basis you, you've received basically no short-term value. You've, you've gained almost nothing from a value standpoint in year one, and David Montgomery is not a guy that you should be looking for long-term value from. He's a 26-year-old running back, soon to be 26-year-old running back. He'll play this season at 26 on basically a two-year deal. Like, they, they've got an out on this contract in two years. So if he replaces Williams one for one, you didn't get any value year one, and you're likely not going to get any value beyond that because of where he's at in his career. I also don't think it's safe to say or safe to assume that David Montgomery will replace Jamal Williams' production one for one. Uh, the Lions last season had 76 offensive plays from inside the five yard line, like goal to go situations. Uh, that was second in the league behind only Kansas City with 83. Nobody else had even 70. The Lions had 76, the Chiefs had 83. Uh, the Lions had 121 offensive plays within the 10-yard line. Uh, that was third in the league behind Kansas City with 148 and Minnesota with 127. Nobody else had more than 120. And, and, and David Montgomery has two career touchdowns outside the red zone. And I think, what, two or three more outside the 10? Either way, a, a large majority of David Montgomery's touchdowns have come inside the 10-yard line, which makes sense. We know that he's not some burner. He's a big, bruising running back who, who breaks tackles. Uh, it makes sense that he doesn't score a lot 
from deep. And so, you know, this is an offense where they were consistently setting up their running backs to score short yardage touchdowns. Last year, Jamal Williams had one 51 yard touchdown, one 13 yard touchdown. Everything else was within the 10 yard line, one seven yard touchdown. Everything else was within the five yard line, one four yard touchdown, three, two yard touchdowns and 10 one yard touchdowns. So they had a ton of volume within the five yard line, within the 10 yard line, a lot of goal to go situations for this offense last year. And Jamal Williams punched a lot of those in. David Montgomery similarly will will probably be relatively dependent on short yardage touchdowns, which means that if we're expecting him to duplicate Jamal Williams' production, at, you know, or at least approximate it to a, a useful level, that means we're necessarily betting on a Jared Goff-led offense being super efficient and creating tons of easy touchdown opportunities two years in a row. I understand the offensive coaching staff in Detroit was awesome. I understand the weapons in Detroit are awesome. I understand Jared Goff is competent. But the other teams who are like up near the top of these, you know, these red zone stats, these goal to go stats are the Chiefs, the Chargers, the Vikings, the Eagles, like the Bengals, like all of these teams with elite or near elite quarterbacks and elite weapons, like a lot less has to go right for a team like that to be super efficient and create easy touchdown opportunities than does a team led by Jared Goff. Like it it's just it's just a flimsier model to build off of. And so, well, I'm not predicting the Lions to be bad on offense this year. I would be a little wary of assuming that David Montgomery duplicates Jamal Williams when doing that means that the Lions have to be like a top five offense again. And I don't know if they, you know, if I'm willing to bet on that from Jared Goff two years in a row. On top of that, David Montgomery wasn't very good last season and he wasn't very good the season before. And he, he's been on a two-year decline here on like his per carry efficiency. In 2021 uh, was his first year below the 100% mark in box adjusted efficiency rating, 93%. That's in the 38th percentile. And last season, he got even worse, 85.9%. That's in the 27th percentile. I understand the Lions are not probably relying on him to create a ton of big plays or be super efficient on a per carry basis. He just needs to grind out tough yards and pass block well and bullshit like that. But still, declining efficiency numbers are indicative of declining ability. And if David Montgomery at some point isn't very good anymore, he's not going to be very good <laughs> good anymore. And he's either going to be less effective when he does play and or get to play less. So we got all that. And on top of all that, the Lions are one of the frequent, the most frequently mocked B. John Robinson destinations. I don't know if he goes there. I think it would be stupid if they took him. I think David Montgomery and DeAndre Swift is a perfectly fine backfield. But lots of media people, full-time media members, think that the Lions have a good shot at, at you know, drafting B. John Robinson. And if that happens, David Montgomery is a total waste at RB20. So there's just a lot of things working against him here, a lot that has to go his way in order for him to even break even at RB20. So I do not think that uh, David Montgomery is being drafted appropriately. He's being overdrafted, as is Rashad White, as is Javante Williams. That's uh, the three running backs who are being overdrafted the most in Dynasty. Catch me on Saturday with something else. Uh, I don't know. But thanks for watching. Hit like, hit subscribe, follow me on Twitter, go to nomoreparties.com. Have a great week. Peace. Thank you.